Good morning, everyone. We are in the middle of a recovery. New York City is coming back. It's a recovery that's strong. It's a recovery that has to reach every corner of the five boroughs. All New Yorkers have to be a part of this. That's why we say recovery for all of us. Cannot be just about status quo. We have to get someplace better. And in this crisis, in the pandemic, we felt so much. People went through so much. There was so much loss. There was so much pain. And there was trauma. And we have to address that. The reality is people are suffering right now in this city. There's a mental health challenge like never before because of what we've all been through. Now think about the people in your life. Think about what you've been through. Think about your loved ones, your family, your neighbors, your friends. Every single person I've met has someone in their life dealing with a mental health challenge right now, especially exacerbated by the pandemic. There's also more consciousness and understanding that we have to address mental health out in the open. We have to talk about it, we have to destigmatize it. We have to get people help, we have to tell people it's okay and make it available like never before. So think about the people in your life and recognize this is a moral imperative to reach everyone who needs mental health support. The way to do that is to make mental health more available than ever before, to make mental health services and support more accessible, more available, more constant than anything we've ever seen before in the history of the city. And the actions we've taken the last year show a new direction. Uh, universal screening for all our kids going to school in September, universal mental health screening to help identify challenges and problems, get kids help work with their families. Uh, support at vaccination centers. We know folks getting vaccinated also are going through everything else, making sure right then and there they know they can access support. Crisis calls, uh, making sure that if a family's in crisis, if an individual's in crisis, we send trained professionals out to help them, civilians whenever possible. New approach that's been really positive. This is a different approach and it's gonna allow us to do so much more. So when we talk about mental health for all, we're taking everything we've learned over the last eight years and we're taking it to the next level. It's a whole new approach, it's a deeper approach. And we're gonna be spreading the word to all New Yorkers that mental health is available for each and every one of you. I want you to see uh, an ad that we'll be showing to really let people know the help is there for them. It's available 24 seven. You're gonna see this on TV and you're gonna see posters and all sorts of other outreach so people know help is there for them. Let's, let's roll the ad so everyone can see it. It's been a tough year for all of us, but NYC is here for you with mental health for all. Now is the time to get help, support, and 24 seven counseling. As our city is coming back, we're here to help you fully recover. Connect to care today. For free and confidential help, call 1-888-NYC-WELL or visit mentalhealthforall.nyc.gov. So that message is clear, it's positive, it's embracing. I want you to hear what this means from the person who from day one of this administration has led the charge, telling all of us that we could go farther than ever before in helping people with mental health challenges and providing support, providing embrace, ending the stigma, opening the door. Uh, her work has been absolutely consistent throughout and has reached so many New Yorkers and helped them through. And this is before we knew there'd be a pandemic, but now this work is more important than ever. My pleasure to introduce the love of my life and our First Lady, Shirley McRae. Thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. Today, we're taking another big leap forward to support New Yorkers with the launch of our new Mental Health for All campaign and website, mentalhealthforall.nyc.gov. For the first time ever, New Yorkers will have a one-stop online resource to connect to the mental health support and professional services that are available to them through the city. Now, when I was preparing for today, I couldn't help but think back to the early days of this administration. We hosted town halls, mental health town halls, in every borough. And we listened to the concerns that people had and the experiences that they had with the services that were available back then. And we heard from all kinds of New Yorkers. 
New Yorkers who, who bravely shared their struggles with us. And, and that has shaped all of the work that we've done. I remember the frustration of an older brother who was trying to get a proper, proper services for his young adult sister who was frequently in and out of emergency rooms. And there was a Dominican father who was desperate to help his son recover from substance misuse. There was also an elderly woman growing fearful of her adult son's episodes, but she was unable to find anyone she could talk to about him and about her own needs. These people, their stories, and many others stay with me to this very day. What was so clear in those rooms and auditoriums and, and other places all across this city was that there was a huge need that was not getting addressed. Mental health challenges touched everyone in some way, but people did not know where to turn for help. We know mental health challenges are common. They are not signs of weakness or personal failure. They are part of the human condition. And that has never been more apparent than this past year, as people have grappled with pain and loss and so much uncertainty, the effects of isolation. We are in the middle of an awakening. People are now talking about, talking openly about mental health in a way they never have before. Conversations that used to happen only in whispers are now happening out loud. And as we come together to write our next chapter, no place in the country is better prepared than New York City to support the mental and physical well-being of its citizens. Every program we've created and grown in the past seven years, from NYC Care to NYC Well, to our mobile crisis teams, they all exist to support you, to give you easier access to care, to help you find support from people who speak your language. And now all of that information is available in one place. This website is a resource that will be maintained and updated regularly. And it will serve New Yorkers beyond this administration. With this website and every program, service, and resource available through it, we keep building on the promise that we made years ago. Your city will be here for you. Amen. Thank you so much, Shirlane. And everyone, this is something we need, and I want you to hear from two folks who have just tremendous perspective on why it is so important to make mental health services more available than ever. First, he spent uh, so much of his life helping our young people as a teacher, addressing their special needs, addressing kids who had challenges, but helping them and their families to realize a way forward. He really has the heart and soul of a caregiver and a teacher. And now he is also an elected official leading the way in the city council for the fight to make sure that mental health services become more and more universal. My pleasure to introduce from the Bronx, council member Eric Dinowitz. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. As it was mentioned, you know, I was a public school teacher. Um, you know, for my students, you know, the question of their needs really rarely started with their academic needs. It wasn't always about those, the books and the pencils. Um, it was about their mental health needs. Our, our children were often in a place where they couldn't even uh, begin to engage in education because of these other factors. Uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges my students faced is just saying, I need help. And once they were brave enough to say that, saying, where can I get help? And it, it wasn't just our children. Uh, when, my, when my students' parents came in, it was often clear that the parents and the entire family unit had needs. And this was all before the pandemic. And uh, with so much isolation and so much loss, so much fear, it is so vital that our children and families have the information they need to access many of the resources that they need and the confidence to express their needs, especially as we start a new school year and our children begin to face significant change and brand new challenges. Um, you know, as, as was mentioned, you know, we focus so much on our physical health. I think because we can see its effects more easily, we can see uh, you know, a broken arm. You can't always see mental health. Um, but I'm looking forward to more and more people getting the support they need and us as a city recognizing and destigmatizing 
those needs so that our children and our families really get the help that they need. Thank you so much, council member. Again, thank you for everything you've done for this city before you ran for office and what you're doing now. But I really appreciate your point about when we're, when we're supporting kids, we're often supporting their parents too. And we're often finding out the parents need help and didn't know where to turn. And this dialogue we're gonna have this school year with families about mental health is gonna be uh, far exceeding anything we've ever done before in terms of bringing these issues forward uh, and helping people connect to what they need. So thank you for your support and, and we're gonna be working closely with you in your district and beyond to make sure that the word spreads about mental health being really available for all. Thank you. Thank you. Now, everyone, I want you to hear from one of the national leaders uh, and the, the really intense effort that we've seen in recent years, a lot, of, a lot of it started right here in New York City, but we're so proud of what we see all over the country. A group of leaders who determined to change the national dialogue about mental health, bring it to the fore, change the whole reality so that we could get people the help they need. And, and this group of leaders, one of whom is here with us today, have started to see the laws of our nation changed and so many other things because they believed we could break a status quo that was absolutely not working and get to a better place. Uh, he is the chief executive of one of the leading organizations in the country, leading the charge, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI. My pleasure to introduce Daniel Gillison. Mayor, thank you very much, and so good to be with you and, and, and the First Lady, and thank you for your, your leadership. Um, um, and uh, as the largest grassroots uh, mental health organization in the nation, we're really uh, pleased to, to be with you and uh, to, uh, to see what you're doing. This is an exciting day for New York City. It's also an exciting day for the nation because so goes New York. So many other communities will be able to follow and, and take the model and build from it. And, you know, there's this saying that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And what you're demonstrating is, is your care. And as you illustrated, uh, First Lady's been involved and, and you guys have been involved for, for eight years in, in this work and you've been building on it. We're excited to be a part of this conversation and this announcement on today. And it's so comprehensive and inclusive what you're doing for the communities, the approach from the youngest to the oldest and the including all communities from LGBTQ plus to veterans, uh, to our elderly. I mean, it's very inclusive and, I, and I'm just so excited that we were invited to, to be here with you. Um, and we know that it's about building coalitions and working collaboratively, and it's all about community. So this is that moment in time, uh, and we know that what came out of last year, to your point, was a lot of pain and fear. And what we learned from last year is that it was a year of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And what that brought us to is this moment in time where mental, mental illness and mental health is, is taking on a, a new focus and it is something where people are saying that, you know, there's strength in me sharing my, my mental journey and there's strength in me sharing my vulnerability. I'm stronger because of it. Uh, now the question is, what are the services? How do we help? And that's what you guys are doing right now. So we're so excited to be with you and to be a part of this conversation. And I would just say that we are uh, looking forward to seeing uh, how you do it, how we can be supportive and engaged with it and being a part of the solution. And I'll just close with this uh, African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And we are excited to be together with you all today. Thank you. Daniel, I love it. Uh, that's, that's a beautiful proverb, and it says so much about what we have to do this moment. And I'll, I'll use another phrase that we often use here in this city, uh, turning pain into purpose. So we've been through a lot of pain in the last year and a half in this country, but what you're doing is turning into purpose. You're making uh, this a moment of change and you're reaching millions of people through your work. So to you and everyone at NAMI, thank you so much for all you do and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the opportunity. So everyone, there it is, Mental Health for All. Says it all, an amazing collection of resources available for the people of this city. Now, we focused in particular, several of us talked about our kids, and they have been through so much. We need to support them in so many ways as we go into the new school year. We need to keep them safe, we need to keep them healthy. So we know, in addition to addressing mental health, the biggest physical health challenge is to overcome COVID, to overcome the Delta variant. 
And that is why this moment is crucial. This is a moment each year. I can tell you as a parent, this is the kind of time of year where parents start to stir and focus, getting kids ready for school, going out shopping. Everything starts to turn towards that moment when school comes back. It's the pivot of the year. So now we want to take this moment and do an intensive effort over the next month to get our kids vaccinated. So back to school becomes vax to school. We want everyone to be thinking about the power of vaccination to keep everyone in the school community safe. Our 12 year olds and up, we're gonna reach uh, thousands and thousands of kids and their parents. In fact, as you heard from Dr. Ted Long uh, yesterday, we can have a moment where the entire family gets vaccinated and everyone benefits from our incentive program as well. So we've launched an intensive back to school vaccination campaign already in the past week over 250,000 calls to parents direct calls to have the conversation to let them know that vaccination could be done in their community or even in their home it's free and you get the hundred dollar incentive for every family member who gets vaccinated uh, we're going to do an ad campaign on top of this huge ad campaign eight languages and we want people to feel this moment this is the moment for kids to get vaccinated this is the crucial moment Right now, 12 year old and up, soon uh, we'll be able to reach younger kids. We believe that'll happen later on this calendar year. So we need to focus this moment on getting kids vaccinated. You see on your screen, a uh, really wonderful moment up in the Bronx, uh, Dr. Choksi and Chancellor Misha Ross Porter and I with some young people getting vaccinated and young people get it. Young people a lot of times are telling their parents, I wanna be safe, I wanna fully participate, I need to be vaccinated. So I want you to see this outreach effort. You're going to feel it over the next month constantly, but I want you to see the ads we'll be running in both English and Spanish examples here, getting the word out to all New Yorkers. Oh, back to school, back to school, to prove to dad that I'm not a fool. I got my lunch packed up, my boots tied tight, I hope I don't get in a fight. Oh, back to school, back to school, back to school. Okay, that's different. <laughs> okay, you're gonna work on your English and your Spanish. We'll run them now. Okay, that was just a teaser, huh? Teaser, yeah. I liked it, it set the stage very nicely. These guys are mischievous. You right always here. do your best to keep your child safe, especially during the pandemic. If your child is at least 12 years old, getting them vaccinated against COVID-19 will keep them safer everywhere they go and whatever they do. The COVID-19 vaccines are effective at preventing disease and millions of adolescents have already been vaccinated safely. Get your child vaccinated against COVID-19 before school starts. Visit nyc.gov slash COVID vaccine. Siempre haces todo por mantener a tus hijos a salvo, especialmente durante la pandemia. Si tu hijo tiene al menos 12 años, vacunarlo contra el COVID-19 lo mantendrá aún más seguro, a donde quiera que vaya y en las actividades que realice. Las vacunas contra el COVID-19 son eficaces para prevenir enfermedad. Y millones de adolescentes ya fueron vacunados de manera segura. Vacuna a tu hijo contra el COVID-19 antes de comenzar la escuela. Visita nyc.gov diagonal COVID vaccine. All right, now, you're gonna be seeing those ads, you're gonna be seeing all sorts of outreach and communities, right down to the grassroots. We are making sure that we reach the kids of this city and that we get everyone ready for school the right way, starting with vaccination. So everyone, please spread the word, because it's gonna make a huge impact getting our school year off to the right start. Now, I wanna to switch to another part of our recovery, come back in New York City, Amazing things are happening with our homecoming week, absolutely stunning events all over the city, and people are feeling the energy. Last night, an amazing, a literally legendary night in Staten Island, Wu-Tang Clan, back together. The Wu-Tang Clan, uh, we officially declared it Wu-Tang Clan Day yesterday. Uh, amazing energy, love, positive feelings there at that concert. Homecoming week continues. Uh, tonight, the premiere of Spike Lee's new documentary, NYC Epicenters, 9-11 to 2021. 
That's going to be at uh, Rockefeller Park, Lower Manhattan. Gates open at 6.30. And Rooftop Films screening the New York City premiere of Netflix and Marcus A. Clark's Blood Brothers. Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. Jackie Robinson Park in Harlem also 6.30 beginning. And you can get tickets to any of the, all these events and information at nyc.gov slash homecoming week. Now, tomorrow, Thursday, Brooklyn Army Terminal, major, major concert, incredible lineup, old school and new school. A reminder that hip hop, its entire history, it's about New York City, it's from New York City, it's of and by and for New York City. Many greats shaped hip hop's history but few had the impact of our next guest. He is one of the greatest MCs of all time. He is one of the people who built this history with his own creativity, his own brilliance. He is gonna be in Brooklyn tomorrow night and people are pumped up. My great pleasure to introduce him with this key message. Ain't no half stepping. He's the Big Daddy Kane. Big Daddy Kane, all yours. <laughs> hey, how you doing? I'm feeling good. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. I'm great. I'm um, looking forward to, you know, putting on a, a, a great show tomorrow. Well, tell us, tell us what this means to you to have all these amazing people coming together to celebrate our city. Um, I think that it's amazing. You know, I'm born and raised in, in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, so to, um, come home and perform, you know, it's such an honor to me. And to see everybody uniting and doing something like this, you know, for a beautiful cause, I just think it's, it's, it's amazing, you know, and I hope that everybody comes out and have a great time. Now, what do you say, we got some doubting Thomases out there who have been saying that New York City wouldn't survive all this and New York City wouldn't come back. I wanna hear a little bit of your wisdom. What would you say to those who doubt New York City? Doubt New York City, man. New York City su survived the, 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 the crack era of the 80s and the blackout in 77. We warriors. We built for this all day, every day. I think that was perfect. I think you said it beautifully, and I yeah. agree with you. And, and this, what we're doing this homecoming week, showing people the energy, the vibrancy, but also the creativity. And I want to thank you because we're having artists from each borough performing in their own borough and reminding people just the richness of talent. So I want to say one more thing as your fellow Brooklynite. Talk to me about, <laughs> talk to me about what Brooklyn has contributed to hip hop and to music in our time. Um, well, I mean, from the days of um, Grandmaster Flowers and Master D in the 70s on up to the 80s with myself and then the 90s with Biggie and Jay-Z and the new millennium with Fabulous. You know, we have always been here presenting great lyricism, great style and fashion. And, you know, those are contributions that I think that we have put into this here thing of ours that we call hip hop. Well, I think we can also agree New York City, greatest city in the world and Brooklyn center of the universe. Would you agree with those statements? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I can't thank you enough. Listen, your presence, people are so excited that you're going to be there tomorrow night and you're doing something beautiful for Brooklyn. You're doing something beautiful for New York City. I want to thank you. And it's an honor. Thank you. Big Daddy Kane. This means so much to all of us. Thank you so much for having me. We'll see you soon. All right. All right, everybody. So a lot going on. And I got to tell you, um, it's so impressive, the amount of love, the amount of passion that's being put into bringing this city back. Um, but I want to talk about another topic now. And it's a tough one because we've got a lot of love and passion for our neighbors down in Haiti who are going through so much and for the community here that is going through so much. Uh, there's an outpouring of love we're seeing these last few days, an outpouring of support. New Yorkers who want to help yesterday, we talked about the amazing effort the NYPD is putting together to collect a humanitarian relief for Haiti, reminding all New Yorkers who want to help the people of Haiti and they, they keep going through so much in these last days, you can donate your support through the Mayor's Fund, nyc.gov slash fund. But we have a new approach. We want to encourage city workers across the board, hundreds of thousands of city employees to get into the game and support this 
vital effort to help the Haitian people uh, by making a donation through payroll deduction. Uh, we've done this in some other crises before. It's a crucial tool. It's provided a lot of help. We're going to start this up on Friday for any employee who wants to participate. Uh, I want to give credit where credit is due. The idea to do this now on behalf of the people of Haiti came from our public advocate. I want to thank him. He's always looking out and looking for where we can do better. And I want to give him a chance to speak about why this is so important to support the people of Haiti and our community here. My pleasure to introduce public advocate, Jamani Williams. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me, Jamani? Yes, I can. Peace and blessings. Uh, love and light to you. Peace and uh, blessings. Thank you. Como uh, uh, First of all, uh, it's great to come after Big Daddy Kane because I'm a hip hop head. I know I saw you out there in, in Staten Island. And you may also want to rethink using the uh, Adam Sandler commercial. It was actually pretty good. Um, but, <laughs> By the um, way, I want to just say, uh, you, you were having a very good time out there in Staten Island. I, I, I admired. You, you had every lyric ready. <laughs> uh, Hip-hop raised me, so it's, it's exciting. And thank you for helping bringing, you know, just lifting up that culture and making New York City excited to, to come back. So I appreciate that. Um, and, you know, uh, we all just continue to have uh, uh, prayers of uh, peace and comfort uh, for Haiti, uh, specifically people for Lachai and Jelami. Um, uh, unfortunately, we were close to similar situations almost uh, 10 years ago. Um, and really, we shouldn't be back here again, but we are. Uh, they just had the assassination of their president. There's 11 million people there. I'm not sure uh, what other nation would go through this. And we wouldn't have this all over the, the news cycle. And they have a a hurricane on the way. Uh, so whatever we can do to help, uh, I want to do that. And I was with you and uh, when uh, Councilman Farrell Lewis brought us together at that press conference, uh, Jackson Rockenster from um, uh, and uh, Perez uh, Luxama for Life of Hope, uh, and also doing some some great work. Uh, uh, but this was it was important to me, and I do want to shout out Pastor Sam Nicholas, uh, who actually reminded me uh, that we were part of getting this done the last time. Uh, and I thought it was a very important, and I just want to say thank you. As soon as I called you, there was no hesitation. Uh, you thought it was an awesome idea, and you, you put it into place in a matter of, what is it, maybe uh, two days now. Uh, it's, it's really important that we make this as easy as possible, um, especially because uh, people, there's a lot of things going on right now. People may want to assist, and then just really quickly another emergency comes to their mind. So making this as easy as possible uh, is the best way. We do know that people are donating supplies, which is helpful, but it costs money to, uh, to donate to get those supplies over there. And you have to coordinate all of them. Um, the best thing I think folks can do if they have it is donate some funds. And that's everybody. Uh, you don't have to be a city employee or not. But what this does is makes it just so much easier and provides incentives for city employees to just donate what they can directly uh, to the fund to go to the communities, uh, to the organizations that are doing the work. We did see some organizations not do the work they were supposed to last time. We're not going to let that happen this time. So uh, you and I are both vetted organizations that are doing amazing work. We want the money to go to them on the ground. We're in touch with people on the ground. Uh, we as New York have stood together for our fellow New Yorkers uh, and, dias and di various diasporas in the past. Uh, we got to do it again. Uh, we know how much Haiti and the Haitian diaspora I mean to this city. Uh, and we can't let them go through this alone. We have to come together once more. We also have to remind they need sustained help uh, even after the uh, the acute emergencies go. Uh, so just thank you again, Mayor, and uh, I'm just hoping we can get this out far and wide to city and employees. Uh, that it's much easier to help donate our brothers and sisters uh, who are suffering right now. Thank you so much. Listen. Public advocate, I, I really appreciate you putting this idea forward immediately. We're acting on it right now. Again, starting Friday, I'm going to sign up. I encourage all city employees. Let's help the people of Haiti. Uh, they've been through so much. Uh, and it's a community here in this city that we need. And, to, and we support in so many ways. And but I want to thank you for leading the charge on this. Thank you. Thank you. The union for the force. All right. Thank you. So everybody. So much going on and, and challenges for sure. And every day we're talking about things we have to overcome. And there's a lot of things thrown at us like the Delta variant here and the horrible challenges people in Haiti are experiencing. But there's also a lot of examples of progress, a lot of examples of forward motion, even in the midst of the challenges. And New Yorkers always deserve credit. Find a way to move forward. 
Um, I have Big Daddy Kane's words ringing in my ear about the nature of New Yorkers and how we've overcome so much. Well, right now, there's some good news. Uh, we've got a new report out that talks about one of the most vital elements of New York City life and our economy, which is film and TV. This has been uh, one of the things that has defined New York City to the world is that so many powerful works of art are created here and portray our life and it's part of what bonds literally people all over the world to New York City. It's also a huge part of our economy. So many creative folks, so many people who work to make this industry what it is. For a long time the industry suffered and then we saw some great efforts over the last years to bring this industry to its fullest possibilities. And the report has pointed out that we are now at an all-time, right before COVID, we were at an all-time high with the film and TV industry, 82 billion in total economic output, staggering figure for one industry, 82 billion, and over $18 billion in wages. So the question a lot of people, of course, said, well, the pandemic threw everything off. What's gonna happen? Will it come back? You wanna know there's a recovery underway? You want some proof? Here's some proof, 34, Film projects right now, filming in New York City this month. 34 happening right now and more coming all the time. It's unbelievable. This comeback is making a world of difference. And uh, the beauty of these shows that are produced here, that portray our life, it makes me very proud as a New Yorker. And one of my favorites, I happened to be over on the set uh, watching and I got to go there a few months ago back in April and saw the total determination of the cast and crew to bring back this show, which is now going into its second season tonight. And uh, if you saw the first season, you are a devotee, as I am, as Jerlaine is. Of course, you may have guessed by now, we are discussing Aquafina is Nora from Queens. Amazing, amazing show. Uh, captures the life of the city. It's a joyous show. It's a funny show. It's a poignant show. It's amazing. One of the stars is with us today. He has done uh, amazing work in this show and on so many other great productions on screen and on the stage. Uh, famous for his work in Law and Order, which you can definitely see anytime you turn on a television. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can find Law and Order. But uh, <laughs> but won a Tony, legendarily won a Tony for his work in M. Butterfly, and he plays Nora's, I think, wise, sometimes confused, but always honest and real and heartfelt dad in this amazing show. I'm a fan of his, I'm a fan of the whole cast, and I thank them for what they do for New York City. My pleasure to introduce B.D. Wong. Um. Mr. Mayor, Mayor de Blasio, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity <laughs> to be here with all these great people to just share my enthusiasm about being a New Yorker and my role, this small role in um, the recovery of the New York film and television industry. Um, I am uh, not a native, a, more than a 30 year New Yorker, a very proud New Yorker. I've, I've made my home here for more than 30 years. And par primarily because of the uh, theater, film, and television industries, I, I, it was my goal as a as a kid to come here and and live the dream of being an actor. And I have been blessed and happy to have done so ever since then. And a, a big part of this is the vibe of what it means to be a New York actor, as you might know. Um, you know, as you say, the this, this show Aquafina is Nora from Queens, which is on Comedy Central tonight, premiering its second season Wednesday at 10 o'clock, is, um, you know, even if that wasn't happening, I would be here to tell you that um, it is, uh, the, our second season of shooting the show was a, was a very, very challenged, but like all the other shows, you know, challenged by this new thing of COVID, but uh, triumphant in its ability to get the work done and to spread the word that um, that that these film projects were um, 
able to move forward in New York City and how proud we were of that and how happy we were to have accomplished that at the end of the season when the, the final wrap day occurred. We were thrilled to have you and First Lady uh, Sherlane come to the set. It was a it's a, always a great thrill and an honor to have the mayor of New York come and visit the, the, the show that you're shooting in New York. The essence of the show it, the heartbeat of the show is New York City, is specifically Queens, and you can't replicate that anywhere else in the world, of course. And and we, um, I think w this show is one of many shows that chooses to shoot in New York and does shoot in New York because of that vibe and that specialness and the specialness of being able to go out into the streets of New York or into the homes of New York or the locations of New York and capture them and bring them to the people in the rest of the country um, and bring an authenticity and a pride of what it means to be a New Yorker to the, the, the people wherever they live. I, you know, in 2000, the year 2000, my son was born. My son is now just turned 21. By the way, a, a staunch um, uh, uh, Manhattan Transit uh, uh, advocate and documentarian. And I um, remember at that time, I, I got the opportunity to sign a contract on Law & Order SVU. And I was grateful to be able to get a steady job in New York City as a New York actor that I stayed with for 11 years, primarily because I did not want to leave New York, this new family that I had just been a big part of starting and um, didn't want to leave town. And I was great. I have been grateful ever since to Dick Wolf and to the city of New York and, and the ability that the show was had to shoot in New York to have that livelihood. And I am just one of many people uh, cast and crews of these thousands and thousands of people who make their livelihood on the film and television industry in New York. I'm grateful that that is, uh, uh, it is such a thriving and vibrant and um, uh, prideful industry. And I'm also here to say that um, uh, through this entire, I, I got a, a shout out to the New York Health and Hospitals, the New York Health Department, and the, the Mayor's Office of uh, Media and Entertainment for all of the incredible work that it did to make sure that the uh, the crew and the actors and the, the everyone who was working on these shows were safe, that the work could continue, that the, the work uh, was able to be completed. And I, for one, uh, am very, um, really, really gratified by that, 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 you know, it was one of those, it was like, you know, it, it's a team effort always being on an, on a, on the crew of a show. And, and yet at, there's a little extra thing that happened when COVID put this kind of wall up that um, we kind of had to climb over. And um, I, I think we're all a little bit even more proud that we got through it because of that. So thank you to you and the first lady and to everyone who did any part in, you know, now there's a whole new department for every, uh, show, uh, which is the COVID department that takes care of all of the testing and all of the, the, um, the things that come up surrounding um, how new actors come in and out of the shows and all of that stuff. And, and as an actor, and I think the actors in ourselves, we are mo the most vulnerable people because we are the ones who actually have to work maskless for a certain amount of the time that we're working. And uh, so we're thankful. I, I mean, I'm I'm repeating myself at this point, but thank you for this opportunity <laughs> to tell New York that um, that uh, that we're alive and well, and that that the, the the industry is thriving. As you say, with your statistics, they can't be they can't be beat. They're, they can't be you can't do better than that. Um, it really is a, a sign, perhaps, of other things being able to be to be. Um, uh, pushed forward and, and to blossom because uh, they, it gives us a little bit of hope. And thank you and to the First Lady for your enthusiasm on the show. Again, it, it um, premieres tonight on Comedy Central at 10 p.m. and shows every Wednesday. And it's, it's a very sweet New York show with a wonderful star at the center of it, Aquafina, someone to watch. And um, uh, we thank you so much for your support. D, thank you. I love your passion for this place. I really do, and your heartfelt. You're, you know, it, it means a lot to all of us that you and all your colleagues said we got to keep going. And yes, uh, I know do. where I know where I'm going to be at 10 p.m. tonight, <laughs> and what I'm going to be watching. <laughs> I'm like Charlene and I keep we kept getting the day wrong. We're like, is it this week? Is it tomorrow? And like, <laughs> uh, it's finally here. <laughs> I want to tell you, I love I what love you it. do. I love the whole cast. 
the episode about grandma's origins in China is uh, yeah. one of the greatest comedic works I have seen in years. So. Oh yes, it was very wonderful. Wasn't it amazing? I, I, one that I wasn't in, I was, I, I was very jealous not to be in. And we have a little bit, a few of those tricks up our sleeve this, this season. And so I look forward to hearing your reaction to the stuff that we have going on. I actually directed one of the episodes oh, wow. this, this season. And that was a really great opportunity for me as well. Congratulations. And some of the stuff that we have there mirrors some of the stuff we did in the, in the first season. So we're looking forward to hearing how you guys think of it. Thank you, BD. And thank you to everyone, all your colleagues. And listen, everybody, I'm going to give you a tip. If you have not seen this show, go binge watch the first season <laughs> and then start watching tonight the second season. Unbelievable. Very Thank good. you. Thank you, BD. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> All right. So well, we covered a lot of ground today. Um, and again, we've got challenges, but we've also got really powerful things that New Yorkers are doing. I love what BD said about the commitment of the actors, the crew, everyone to keep producing these amazing works of art for the people of this city and this whole nation. Well, we also, every single day, are seeing extraordinary work to keep us all safe. And we got some breaking news from earlier this morning, and real credit uh, to the NYPD, to Manhattan North, uh, to uh, the DA's office, Cy Vance and all his colleagues in the Manhattan DA's office, a major gang takedown in Manhattan North, the Chico Gang, which has been responsible for multiple shootings in East Harlem. Uh, months and months of patient, careful work went into taking a number of criminals off the streets. And this is so important, and you'll get all the details uh, in the coming hours. This is so important because what we know, NYPD always makes clear, is a very small number of people who do the violence in the city, and every time we take down a gang, we change the situation fundamentally for the city and particularly for the neighborhood. And we're going to keep doing this incessantly. We're getting some real cooperation from prosecutors. We're getting cooperation from courts. We want to keep seeing the court system open up more and more, but we've definitely seen improvement. But major gang takedown and another step forward to making this city, as it has been for years and years, continuing our role as the safest big city in America. Okay, now let me go to indicators. And first and most important, we said the things we're going to be looking at are vaccination, uh, hospitalization cases. So most important, we continue to make progress on vaccination. Uh, doses administered to date, 10,368,161. And that number is going to keep jumping up as we apply more and more uh, new tools to make sure that people get vaccinated. Number two, daily number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Today's report, 168 patients. Confirmed positivity level, 36.16%. Hospitalization rate per 100,000, 1 1.36. And then new reported cases on a seven-day average. Today's report, 1,647 cases. A few words in Spanish, going back to where we started on mental health, an issue that is of concern to every community in this city, and we're going to do a lot to get the word out to everyone. Una mejoría que prioriza su salud mental es una mejoría para todos. Por eso, vamos a llegar a todos los New Yorkinos a través de nuestra nueva campaña. No Tengo, excuse me, no tenga miedo a pedir ayuda. Su ciudad está aquí para usted. With that, let's turn to our colleagues in the media. And please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. Good morning. We will now begin our Q&A. As a reminder, we are joined by Dr. Ted Long, the executive director of the Test and Trace Corps, and Health Commissioner Dr. Dave Choksi. Our first question for today goes to James Ford from PIX11. Right off the bat, and I appreciate that. And speaking of bad, you're, you're, like you're the spark plug. James, you're the spark <laughs> plug today. <laughs> and, and you know, we had a few of those with the Yankees uh, in uh, their doubleheader against oh, some other teams. I don't team want to talk yesterday. about that. We're, we're next topic, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, say. All right, but uh, more relevant, serious stuff, if I may. Uh, you mentioned yesterday 100,000 new vaccinations last week. 
And now that the key to NYC pass is implemented, do we have any preliminary information on what effect it's having on vaccination numbers? I will say anecdotally, by the way, we were at a mobile vaccination site yesterday where demand for shots was nonstop and literally all day they were giving shots. But what does the bigger picture look like? I'll turn to Dr. Long and D Ted Long who can tell you what he's seeing. We are definitely seeing what you just saw. Uh, people have been reporting at sites uh, where previously it was sort of people were coming up in you know, waves, but not nonstop. We're seeing lines again. And this is great. We, this is one occasion, New Yorkers don't love lines, but this is one case where I'm really happy to see lines. Lines of people waiting to be vaccinated. That's fantastic. And we're moving them along quickly. And everyone knows the, you know, the getting the shot is quick and easy. Uh, so definitely we're seeing an impact. I think, James, it's fair to say that each of these measures uh, is building on each other and it will take some time to get to the full impact, but the incentive is having an impact, the, the public employee uh, mandates are having an impact, and you know, it's just the beginning of Key to NYC, but I think it's gonna have more and more impact over the weeks to come. But with that, uh, Dr. Ted Long, any initial readings you can give us on what you're seeing? Yes, thank you, sir. So anecdotally, we're definitely seeing people coming out in droves, whether it's our mobile units at restaurants, whether it's our at-home VAX program, or at our other locations now. And I think what I would say in terms of the statistics to show this, today, for the first time, 75% of all adults in New York City have received at least one dose of the vaccine. It's obviously the highest number we've reached, but we just reached that number today, showing that we're already seeing an uptick in terms of the overall numbers across New York City. That's excellent. Go ahead, James for that. Um, can you allow, this is uh, for my uh, colleague, Henry Rossa. Uh, can you elaborate uh, further on your conversation with Lieutenant Governor Hochul, uh, maybe some specifics about issues like crime, about the key to NYC pass, congestion pricing, some specifics, if you will. You know, James, first of all, a very positive meeting, very productive meeting. Um, you know, we know each other uh, a long time. Again, we haven't worked super closely together, but there's, there's a good relationship going back for years now. Um, we talked especially about fighting the Delta variant and about building a recovery. That was the number one topic. Um, and, you know, a, a good open dialogue on the different approaches and, and what makes sense to do. And I really appreciated, you know, we spent, I think, an hour or more, and it was just a good, healthy, sane, emphasizing the word sane, conversation, which I truly appreciate. As a programming note, we are joined by Dr. Jay Varma, Senior Advisor on Public Health. Our next question goes to Jeff Mays from the New York Times. Hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Hey, Jeff, how you been? Good, good. Thank you. Um, I had a couple questions. Uh, the first one is uh, a, a lawsuit that was filed uh, by restaurant owners um, against your uh, vaccine uh, executive order. Um, they're arguing that it's unfair because certain businesses, uh, such as hair salons and other establishments where people spend uh, long periods of time, such as churches, are not targeted. So I'm wondering if you uh, feel confident that the executive order uh, will hold up in court? And what's your response uh, to these restaurant owners that, you know, your executive order is unfairly targeting them and not other indoor locations? Jeff, the minute we talk about lawsuits, you're not going to be surprised if I say I'm going to keep my comments limited. Uh, I've had the conversation with the law department, uh, tremendous confidence that we're in a very strong legal position. Um, we're, we're in a global pandemic still. Uh, the decisions that have been taken have been taken with the leadership of our health officials uh, who have been fighting this battle uh, from the beginning. And we know we must get more people vaccinated. And strategically focusing on the ways to get more people vaccinated, uh, particularly focusing on uh, young people where there's been a real gap uh, so we can stop the spread of the Delta variant is mission critical. It is about public health and safety. Uh, we're absolutely certain this is a way we will achieve those goals, do it in a, in a smart way, a fair way, based on the data and the science. Go ahead, Jeff. 
Thank you. Um, today, uh, Comptroller uh, Scott Stringer uh, released a report that said the city uh, was basically unprepared for the pandemic. Uh, he said the city lacked an operational plan. Uh, you delayed operational planning for an uh, for outbreak. Uh, you didn't manage the PPP uh, well. There were expired stockpiles of PPE, um, and that you know uh, the city was not um, was not prepared to protect residents against COVID-19. Um, I know you probably haven't seen the report yet, but I'm wondering what you think about those criticisms uh, from the controller's office about the city's response to the pandemic. Uh, one, I, I have not seen the report. Two, um, I, I want to express my respect for the people who did the work, our healthcare heroes, our first responders, uh, the folks who got all those PPE um, from all over the world, the folks who created out of thin air or literally created production lines here in this city uh, for PPE, for ventilators. Um, the, you know, a couple of things are clear to me. And there's, there's no way to fully understand a global pandemic until you're in it. And second of all, we, none of us anticipated anywhere anything like this. And we needed federal leadership that wasn't there. But the, the people in public service who made things happen and, and made sure that care was there for people and then put together you know, test and trace core, put together the biggest vaccination effort in the history of New York City. I, I, I think there's a lot that says this city responded very powerfully. Our next question goes to Marla Diamond from WCBS 880. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor and everybody on the call. Um, can you tell us if uh, the city is negotiating mandatory vaccinations for teachers? Are you negotiating with the UFT on that? And is there a possibility that uh, eligible students will need to show uh, proof of vaccination to start school? Marla, um, we do not uh, anticipate uh, students having to show proof. We obviously want to know uh, who's vaccinated. We want to encourage everyone who's not vaccinated to get vaccinated. Um, we do not uh, anticipate having to provide proof. Um, we've had conversations. I don't, negotiation is not the right word. We've had conversations with uh, the unions representing our uh, school staff of all kinds on the different ways to keep schools safe. Uh, but there's nothing that's been decided beyond what we've announced publicly. And if we have anything new to say, obviously, we're going to be talking about it. Go ahead, Marla. Mayor, I know you spoke about um, the fact that uh, having to show proof of vaccination at restaurants and other indoor venues has improved vaccination. But uh, do you have a breakdown of um, how many New York City school children eligible for the vaccine have gotten vaccinated through your efforts uh, in this last push before the start of school? We know right now, and I, I don't want to parse it. It's a very fair question, Marla. I just don't have it by public school kids versus kids in other schools, but I do have it by age for the city. So right now we're over 56% of our 12 to 17 year olds have gotten at least one dose. That's almost 300,000 kids. Um, and as you saw yesterday with the, the chancellor and our health commissioner, you know, literally every day, more and more kids, families, of course, coming forward uh, a lot, very enthusiastically wanting this. And as Ted Long pointed out, you know, we're literally making it a family thing, vaccinating whole families together, everyone enjoying the incentive, each family member getting that hundred dollar incentive. Um, but the good news in this number uh, over 56 percent is remembering that this has been over a much briefer time frame then vaccination was available for adults. And yet it's a strong number and it's growing regularly. So I think you're gonna see a real push. We're gonna do it, but I think you're gonna see parents just naturally keying into the fact it's time to get their kids vaccinated. And I expect that number to go up very, very substantially. Our next question goes to Elizabeth Kim from Gothamist. Hi, Mayor DeBlasio. Hey, Elizabeth, how you been? I'm good. I wanted to follow up on Marla's question about um, making vaccinations mandatory for teachers. 
we know that Chicago and LA have done it. And I know you just said that nothing has been decided with your discussions with the UFT, but can you say what your position is on it? Would you like to see vaccinations mandatory for teachers before the start of the school year? Elizabeth, I appreciate the question. It's certainly a very fair question. I, I don't tend to just opine. I, I work with people uh, both in the government and uh, partners outside to get to what I think is the right decision, then I'll talk about the decision. What I know I want is the maximum number of people in our schools, kids and adults alike, vaccinated. Figuring the best way to get there is uh, what we're working on right now. And obviously, we'll have a lot more to say on that soon. Um, but I will say I'm very encouraged by uh, the level of parent focus on getting kids vaccinated. I'm very encouraged uh, by what we're seeing amongst the staff, the educators and all staff, uh, really healthy vaccination numbers and growing and a lot of support from the unions involved encouraging their members to get vaccinated. So good trajectory now and we'll have more to say on, you know, wherever else we might do going forward. Go ahead, Elizabeth. So you were asked about this yesterday, but um, U.S. health officials officially recommended that all Americans get the COVID boosters. And I was wondering um, if you or Dr. Choksi could talk about whether that formal announcement has, you know, kind of changed any specific plans about the rollout and what the city is planning to do. Does the city have enough doses to start giving out booster shots and how soon would they do it? Yeah, excellent questions. And uh, I don't think we have Dr. Choksi right now. We have Dr. Long and Dr. Varma, so I'll turn to them. Uh, we have been stockpiling vaccine, uh, knowing that this was likely, uh, that we'd have the announcement on uh, booster shots. Uh, my understanding, and the doctors will confirm it, is that the uh, authorization is to begin on September 20. Uh, so we, we have a lot of vaccine right now. We'll be getting a lot more between now and September 20. And definitely we have the vaccine, uh, both the vaccine and the ability to deliver it. Uh, we've done that on a high level. We'll be able to do that again. Uh, to talk about how that will happen and if you have any of the uh, numbers handy on how much we have uh, in stock, uh, first Dr. Long, then Dr. Varma. Sure, thank you, sir. So in stock right now, we have at least 750,000 doses of vaccine, and we have an ability to order more daily and weekly. Uh, so now that we have the guidance from the Biden administration and we're looking forward to learning more from them as well, we have the ability, as we've done throughout, to order more vaccine so that we can enable ourselves to have the capacity to deliver it to as many people um, as we can, starting when uh, it becomes eligible on September 20th. I really do wanna emphasize something the mayor said, which is really important though which is that um, we've learned a lot in terms of the vaccine effort. We have such a strong infrastructure now that we didn't have before. We have more than 30 mobile units going around the city every day. We have an at-home vaccination program. I don't think any other cities have that. So our ability to really move really, really fast, we'll start ordering the vaccine now for sure, but our ability to deliver it fast to New Yorkers, uh, we're in a very strong place to be able to do that. So we're gonna be ready for September 20th for sure. Thank you, Dr. Varma. Yeah, I would just uh, to add on to what what Ted has said. I think you know New York City's uh, performance and the ability to deliver vaccines is is really unparalleled. And I know there is sort of public discourse about um, is there a choice between having uh, extra doses for uh, you know a third dose for people who have already been vaccinated versus first doses for people who don't have them. And I, I think here in New York City we have the uh, privilege to say that that's not a that's not a choice. Um, that's that's not a, that's not going to be a problem. You can give uh, extra doses, you know, the third dose to people, and you can get first doses into the arms of people who have had and had them before without any challenge. And uh, so I, I think we're all ready and set to go as soon as we get the guidance uh, and as soon as the date starts uh, for us to go ahead. Thank you very much. Our next question goes to Bob Henley from the Chief Leader. Uh, thanks very much for taking the call. Um, the issue of trust in the government uh, is central to the challenge of convincing essential workers to get vaccinated. But trust, as I think you know, is a two-way street. Bureaucracies, even while intentional ones, make mistakes. You may remember at the start of the pandemic that workers in the subway were wearing masks because they read the Financial Times and were aware of the global pandemic at the time. Managers threatened to write them up because a mask was not part of their uniform and the concern that it might scare passengers. I asked you about that 
in the blue room and you aligned yourself with the CDC guidance at the time, which is that masks should be rationed for those who were sick and clinical care staff. Nurses unions warned that the CDC guidance to reuse any N95 masks would lead to their um, death and the spread of the virus. Both things happened. Scroll forward in May, the CDC unilaterally rolled back the universal mask mandate for the vaccinated. The same frontline unions warned that was a major error because so many communities had fewer than 40% of their residents vaccinated. They warned that the CDC guidance put essential workers at risk and that it would help uh, accelerate the spread of the virus. Both things happened. Shouldn't policymakers consult workers and unions before they make decisions of such gravity, like lifting the mask guidance? And didn't that move in May give us a false sense of progress? Well, Bob, a big, sprawling, important question. Um, yeah, I, I would just note, first of all, there's just a constant dialogue going on with many of our unions. Um, there's a, you know, a, a respectful, just day to day, people are talking about a lot of different things, including what's going on, on the ground, hearing people's different views, um, their sense of what makes sense, what doesn't. This is just something we do constantly. Uh, I think with COVID, oftentimes the scientific community and the healthcare community struggled to understand what was the ultimate truth because it was a new disease. Um, so we have to listen to uh, the thoughts of working people and we have to listen to, uh, the, in when it comes to business, the business community, we do. But the ultimate decisions have to be made on the data and the science and what's gonna get us where we need to go, which is obviously to have the maximum number of people vaccinated. But I, I would, if, if what you're saying is it's been hard for people to trust because sometimes the situation has changed, I do appreciate that, but I also wanna be fair to all the, the healthcare community and the scientific community. They've been grappling with an ever-changing situation and a lot of unknowns. They also deserve tremendous credit for having created a vaccine in a, in a time frame we've never seen before that has saved so many lives and turned the situation around. So I, I, you could be distrustful if you wanna be, but you could also be trustful and say, well, that's a stunning achievement. That same scientific and medical community did that for all of us. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, in terms of the question of coherence and guidance, we're into this for a long period of time now. The West Indian American Day Parade noted, uh, put out a notice that they're gonna postpone their parade, I guess, until 2022. In the same city of New York, you're doing a homecoming concert. It seems to me that there is, can your experts talk about this, this is a little, seems a little inco incoherent to a layperson. And would you suggest to people wear masks at the homecoming concerts? Yeah, I don't, I understand the question, obviously, Bob. First of all, every organization had to make its own choice. Um, and we respect the choices. Some organizations have said they want to have their events again. Some want to do a modified version. Some are postponing to 2022. There's not one way of doing things. When it comes to the concerts, they're outdoors. They're for vaccinated folks only. Uh, we are definitely encouraging uh, mask use. Um, 